thank you all for coming. Um, uh, what I propose to try to do is talk through the handout that you have. The main purpose of the, the handout, uh, I do hope you have one, um, is uh, to write down some the few logical formulae that I need to make reference to during the course <coughs> of the talk. Um, so it's not a, an ordinary kind of handout with very much that's helpful apart from that. Um, but having sight of those things, if you're anything like me, is much better than trying to take them in auditorily. Um, uh, right. Well, so the, the plan that I have is to, first of all, explain... Uh, can you hear all right? Uh, yes? A bit. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, shout if I'm fading away. Um, so the plan is to, um, first of all, uh, as it were, set the problem up and then talk very briefly about some other approaches that I uh, don't much like um, and then to explain my own approach to the problem um, and then in whatever time is left uh, try to confront some of the problems facing it. Um, so we use modal words, words like may and must, um, uh, had to, could, um, adjectives like necessary and possible and adverbs like necessarily and possibility in various ways or senses. Um, very often, I think, in ordinary talk and speech, we, we thought we use them in what is generally called an epistemic or epistemological sense. Um, so, uh, waiting for Aunt Mabel on Paddington platform um, uh, and not finding her there, we might say she must have missed her train. Um, uh, <coughs> meaning that that's the most likely explanation for her not being there for all... You know, um, uh, or, or perhaps just that she may have missed her train, meaning for all we know she missed her train. Um, but I, I shall be more interested in what's usually called an alethic or truth-related way of using modal words uh, related to truth rather than knowledge, um, uh, which we perhaps use less commonly in ordinary speech, but we certainly can perfectly well use it and understand it. So we might, knowing full well uh, that Mozart died nearly 20 years before Haydn, we might say that Mozart might have outlived Haydn. Um, I mean, he obviously didn't. Uh, he died, I think, about 18 years before. But, but um, you know, it's, it's in some sense possible that he should have outlived him. Um, uh, and we're clearly there not talking about our knowledge or the state of our knowledge. We know perfectly well that he predeceased Haydn. Um, so it's not that kind of possibility we're talking about. Um, so uh, it's possibility in this latter, possibility and necessity in this latter sense that um, my question about the basis of necessity and possibility concerns. One of the things that's fairly obvious when you think a little bit about the epistemic notion of possibility and the corresponding notion of necessity is that there's a kind of relativity about them. So when we say, in an epistemic sense, such and such uh, may be the case, or perhaps such and such must be the case, we're really saying that uh, for all we know, such and such is the case. Or given what we know, there's no alternative but such and such being the case. That is, we're talking about necessity and po possibility relative to some body of assumed knowledge. Um, uh, so it's a kind of relative rather than 
absolute necessity that's in question, um, and similarly with possibility. Um, and it's plausible that we also have relative notions of necessity and possibility of an alethic sort and having to do with truth. It's, of course, a very controversial example, but uh, it's often thought that, for example, when we talk about natural or physical necessity, when we say that something is physically necessary or naturally necessary, um, this is a kind of relative necessity that we're talking about. We mean something like, given the laws of nature or the laws of physics, such and such must be the case. Um, whether or not the laws of physics or the laws of nature more generally might have been otherwise is a further question and we may, may well think that there is some sense in which they could have been different um, from whatever they actually are and of course we don't necessarily know what they actually are um, although we have beliefs about it um, there's a good question then about how relative notions of necessity and possibility might be explained um, and there is a sort of standard or classic view about this uh, to the effect that to say, I'll stick with the example of physical necessity, that to say that something is physically necessary is to say basically that it's a logical consequence of the laws of physics. And to say that something is physically possible is to say that it's logically consistent with the laws of physics. That is, the laws of physics don't imply its negation. Um, uh, this sort of simple analysis, if we, if we uh, were to symbolise a conjunction of the laws of physics with a capital gamma, for example, if you look on the handout, um, the first formula there, we could express this as a kind of strength, strong conditional. The, the square box at the front is the standard logic, logician's abbreviation for necessarily, or it's necessary that, so that the formula box gamma arrow p just says that it's logically, well, it, well sorry, it's necessary that if the laws of physics hold, then P, where P can be any proposition that we're asserting to be physically necessary. Um, uh, and, well, I w it's straightforward to adapt that to explain physical possibility. Um, uh, one way of doing it would be to say simply that it's not logically necessary uh, that if gamma, then not P. Um, uh, well, um, this, the broad idea underlying this analysis of relative necessity and the corresponding analysis of relative possibility is surely along the right lines, although for various reasons I think it won't do quite as it stands. I don't really need to go into that for present purposes because I'm more interested in the contrasting notion of absolute or non-relative necessity. Um, it's extremely plausible in the analysis of relative necessity to take the necessity that's used in the analysis, the, the necessity that's represented by the initial box, to be logical necessity. Um, and it's then very plausible to think that logical necessity at any rate is not going to be a form of relative necessity itself, what would it be relative to? How would it be analysed? In what kind of, what other notion of necessity might one use to <coughs> explain it? Um, all sorts of awkwardness arises there. So it's plausible that logical necessity is at least one kind of non-relative or absolute necessity. Whether it's the only kind of absolute necessity, that is whether the converse holds that any form of absolute necessity is logically necessary, is much more controversial. Uh, some very famous people have basically thought that it was the only kind of 
necessity. Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, for example, um, and following him, at least if one construes logical necessity in a broad way, the logical empiricists in the first half of the 20th century or so. Um, but on the other hand, since then, famously, people have uh, taken the opposite view, um, especially and uh, most prominently um, Saul Kripke, um, who brought to our attention the range of uh, necessities which uh, are plausibly regarded as being knowable only a posteriori. Um, uh, these range from what he calls theoretical identifications, like um, light is a stream of photons, or <coughs> heat is mean molecular energy, I'm putting them very roughly as he does, um, things like water is dihydrogen oxide, um, and examples of identity statements, like Hesperus is Phosphorus, or the morning star is the evening star, these can all be argued plausibly to be necessary in some quite strong sense. Indeed, Kripke says the strongest possible sense. He never uses the term absolute necessity, um, but he makes it very clear that he thinks that this kind of necessity, which other philosophers, though not him, I think, have called metaphysical necessity, is a strong, the strongest sort of necessity that there is. Um, so that's really what I'm especially interested in, this absolute necessity. Uh, um, and uh, Well, um, let me say a little bit about um, the logic of absolute necessity. This question is a question about what logical principles govern this kind of necessity and the corresponding notion of possibility and they're going to be quite important in what I'm going to be saying later. Um, so um, this is not a lecture about lo modal logic so I'm, I'm going to just briefly indicate some of the main principles that are in question here. Um, so if we just look at, at section 1.3 on the handout the first principle tells you that if a conditional is necessary and its antecedent is necessary, then so is its consequent. A way of expressing what it says is that what follows necessarily from what is necessary is itself necessary. And that seems a pretty uh, innocuous and obvious principle that we should accept. It's known as the K principle. It's the principle of the weakest normal modal logic. Um, the next principle, the principle labelled T, just says that what's necessary is true. Um, right. <coughs> so if it's necessary that 2 plus 2 is 4, then 2 plus 2 is 4. Um, and as long as one's talking about an alethic form of necessity, uh, that seems also something we should pretty certainly accept. Beyond that, the principles that I've listed are all more, well, <coughs> much less obvious. Uh, the next principle, labelled S4, because, that's the, because it's the characteristic principle of the logical modal system known as S4, says that what's necessary is necessarily necessary. Um, and, well, you might doubt that. Um, the B principle says that what's true is at least necessarily possible. And finally, the S5 principle says that if something is even possibly necessary, then it's necessary. Now, none of these principles is obviously true, these last three. Um, uh, they, I've listed them in order of, roughly speaking, increasing strength. 
So if you take the K and the T principle and you add the S4 <laughs> principle, you get a stronger system. Uh, likewise, if you add the B principle, but not the S4 principle, you get a stronger system alternative to the S4 system. If you add the B principle um, and the T principle to the K principle, <coughs> Then you get, in effect, this, uh, well, sorry, if you, if you add the S5, the, the S5 axiom gives you, or the S5 principle gives you the strongest of all normal modal systems. Um, so it's a, a very strong modal logic. Um, uh, I can take further questions about that if, if people are interested, but I, that's as much as I need for present purposes. Um, my own view is that the right modal logic for metaphysical necessity, for absolute <coughs> necessity, is this very strong modal logic, S5. Um, that's a view that is certainly controversial. Um, I'm not now going to present an argument for it, but again, I'm quite happy to give arguments well, you know, perhaps I will give a quick argument for it. Um, uh, the quick argument relies on, uh, the quickest argument I can think of, relies on what is known as the possible world semantics for modal logic. So the idea of the possible world semantics is that you interpret the uh, modal operators, the box and the corresponding possibility operator, usually written as a diamond, with respect to uh, formal models involving a set of points, usually known as possible worlds, uh, and you treat truth as a relation between propositions and worlds, so that a proposition may be true at this world, false at another world, and so on. And then to say that, to cut a longer story very short, to say that a proposition is necessary it's just to say that it's true relative to each point in the set, that is, relative to each possible world. And to say that a proposition is possible is to say that it's true at at least one world in the set. Now, the short argument I have in mind, the key idea in it, is that for absolute necessity, I mean, in, well, in general, when one sets up models of this kind, the question arises whether each of the worlds or points in the model is accessible to or possible relative to the other ones. You know, and so you have, I left out a kind of crucial element in, these, in the usual models, they have what's known as an accessibility or relative possibility relation. So that you may have a set of worlds, W1, W2, W17, W105 and so on, and then a relation that says which of them is possible relative to which. Um, and uh, the various constraints can be put on that relation, and depending on what constraints you put, uh, you get different modal principles verified by the system. Uh, so that if, for example, you require that the relation of relative possibility is transitive, that is if world one, if world two is relative, relatively possible, possible relative to world one, and world three is relatively possible to world two, then world three is possible relative to world one. If you have that principle, transitivity, then you get the S4 axiom coming out. That gets validated. If, in, if you require that the accessibility or relative possibility relation is symmetric, that is, if world one accesses world two, then world two accesses world one, goes both ways, then you verify the B axiom. Uh, if you require that it's reflexive, that is, each world accesses itself, then you val validate the T axiom. If you require all three things, then you validate the S5 principle. You get reflexivity, transitivity, and symmetry. And that, in effect, means that every world is accessible to every other world as well as itself. Right. The kind of short argument I think one can give to for the making 
absolute necessity, an S5-like, having, having an S5-like logic, is that you really require that every world should be accessible, possible, relative to every other world. Because if you had worlds that were not accessible to, any given, to a given world, then there would be, as it were, a possibility of some proposition that is necessary at a given world being false at some other world that wasn't accessible to that world. So it wouldn't be absolutely possible. Um, well, that's a very rough statement or indication of um, an argument that needs to be stated more tightly, but it will give you an idea. There are other arguments, but um, I, that is the one that persuades me. Okay, let me move on to talking about problems um, a bit. Okay, so quite a long time ago, um, Michael Dummett formulated, in my view, very succinctly, the central problem about philosophical problem about necessity and indirectly about possibility. As he put it, the philosophical problem of necessity is twofold. What is its source and how do we recognise it? Uh, this is a beautifully simple formulation of the two problems. One problem, the first problem, is clearly a problem in metaphysics. It's a problem about the basis of necessity. What makes things necessary when they are, assuming they are? The second problem is a problem in epistemology. Assuming that there are some necessities, how do we get to know them? Um, well, uh, I'm going to be here concerned with the metaphysical problem, but it's worth <laughs> emphasising that the two problems are really inseparable in the sense that it's pretty well a condition on an acceptable answer to the metaphysical question, what is the basis of necessity, that it should ideally lead to, and at the very least not preclude, giving a non-mysterious explanation of how we get to know necessities. Um, and there's a real chance that an otherwise attractive theory of modality an attractive answer to the first question may come unstuck precisely because it doesn't lead to or maybe even seems to preclude any reasonable answer to the epistemological question. Um, okay. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about this but I ought to mention that some philosophers have been pretty pessimistic about the possibility of answering Dummett's first question. Um, one of them, um, uh, Simon Blackburn, a number of years ago, produced what might seem to many to be a lethal dilemma for any attempt to answer the first question, to give what Blackburn calls a truth conditional <coughs> account of necessity, an account which tells you what makes necessary propositions true. Um, the dilemma goes like this. Um, suppose we say that it's necessarily the case that P because it's the case that Q. Doesn't matter what P and Q are here. Then either Q itself is necessary or it isn't. If it is necessary, then we're just explaining one necessity by reference to another. We've got what Blackburn calls a bad residual must. We haven't really explained necessity because we've just appealed to another necessity. If, on the other hand, Q isn't necessary, that is, it might have been otherwise, it need not have been the case that Q, well then, says Blackburn, we haven't so much as explain necessity as explained it away. It isn't really necessary that P because it might not have been the case that Q and had it not been the case that Q, it might not have been the case that P. So it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, so we seem to be skewered. Well, I'm going to come back to Blackburn's dilemma later. Needless to say, I don't think it's convincing. Um, 
Uh, okay, so let me say a little bit um, about some <coughs> unsatisfactory answers. Um, philosophers who uh, don't agree with Blackburn that we should um, give what he calls a, a projective account of necessity, that is, explain it really is not so much to do with anything in the world, but rather as we should treat statements of necessity as an expression of our inability to imagine things being otherwise or something like that. Other philosophers have tried to give what are commonly called reductive or reductionist theories of necessity. That is, they've tried to explain necessity uh, and possibility in other wholly non-modal terms. Um, there are two main ways in which philosophers have tried to do this, one rather older than the other. The older way is um, conventionalism and what's sometimes called the linguistic theory of necessity. Um, so on this view, uh, um, what, what makes some statement necessary in the only sense in which statements can be necessary um, is linguistic convention or the way we use words. It's necessary that vixens are female just because we have a convention that vixen means female fox um, and that guarantees that vixens are female expresses the truth. So the necessities just reflect linguistic conventions that we've adopted. Um, the, the, the attraction of this kind of theory is obvious. Um, it gives a simple, unmysterious explanation of necessity and it makes use of resources that we need anyway because we need the notion of meaning or convention to explain how we succeed in stating true or false things about the world anyway. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about why I reject this theory, but I'll just gesture at the reasons that one might worry about it. One reason one might worry about it is whether or not the theory is capable of dealing with what we might call Kripkean necessities, necessities that are known at best a posteriori and don't seem to reflect linguistic conventions at all. It's not a matter of linguistic convention that water is H2O or that light is a stream of photons or that heat is mean molecular kinetic energy um, or whatever. Um, these things seem to be uh, n not, not to have their source in any linguistic conventions or just in meanings. Now, some defenders of conventionalism have tried to uh, in very interesting ways, tried to accommodate uh, Kripkean necessities. Um, I'm not going to go into details about that because I think that co conventionalism and more generally the ling linguistic theory comes unstuck at a much earlier point uh, with the, in the case of the very statements that, well, even before you bring Kripkean necessities into the issue, there's a problem, a problem that was exposed a long time ago in 1936, I think, by the great American logician and philosopher um, Willard Quine, and in a slightly different form, presented some years later by Michael Dummett in the paper from which I quoted earlier. Um, basically, the problem is that it's very hard to see how conventionalism, or more generally the linguistic theory, can accommodate all necessities. Um, uh, it's very tempting to say that something necessary is true by definition, but as Quine points out, what definitions really do is not to create truths. They really simply enable you to write longer truths more briefly, so that instead of writing the long or fairly long truth that unmarried men are unmarried, we can write it more briefly as bachelors are unmarried. So the meaning convention that says bachelor means unmarried man enables you to simply shorten a longer truth. It doesn't tell you about the source of the original truth. You're still left to explain why it is that bachelors 
sorry, why it is that unmarried men are unmarried is necessary. We've said nothing about that. Um, now, at this point, you might start trying to say something about the meanings of the logical constants, uh, like all and 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 so on. Um, uh, but uh, you get stuck. Quine's message really is that you need conventions of a different kind. You need conventions that amount to direct stipulations of the truth of certain statements. Um, but of those, there can only be finitely many. The snag is that there are infinitely many necessary truths to account for. Uh, and once you try to account for all of them, you get stuck in an infinite regress, a vicious infinite regress. Dummett makes a similar sort of point um, uh, about logical consequence. That you, know, you may say that some truths are directly stipulated, and they're necessary, and that other truths are necessary because they're logical consequences of them. But then you only have to think about the conditional that connects the generating truths and the consequential truths. That itself is going to be necessary, so you've got a yet another necessity to account for. Um, and you get very quickly back into Quine's regress. So, no good. I mean, that's all very dogmatic and brief, but that's the idea. The other main contender, the other main contender for a reductive theory of necessity uh, is the um, builds on the idea that necessity is truth as it's sometimes put at all possible worlds and possibility is truth at at least one. Um, on the face of it this kind of explanation doesn't look very promising because we've had to use the notion of possibility in characterizing the worlds. Um, but David Lewis in particular um, uh, defends or defended uh, a very strong form of realism about possible worlds in which he argued that one could explain the notion of possible world without making use of modal notions and that there were enough of them and sufficiently varied ones to account for all the possibilities. Um, you simply take a world to be a spatio-temporally closed system and you give up the idea that there is just one such thing. Uh, there, on the contrary, there are very, very many of them. Um, Lewis actually tells you, well, not how many, but that there are a lot. Uh, if you know what the continuum is, uh, there are two to the power of the continuum, <laughs> at least. Um, so... A, very, very many. It's a high order, fairly high order of infinity. Well, not as set theorists go, but you know, it's it's a seriously large number. Um, more points than there are in the line, uh, or in space. Um, uh, and in order to ensure that there's sufficient variety, because of course, just multiplying the same old world over and over again is hardly going to give you a theory of necessity and possibility. You have to say that there are lots of different worlds, right? Different each possible way. Um, <coughs> Lewis gets that by a principle of recombination, which in his case is to the effect that, roughly speaking, each world is made up of a lot of individuals, different individuals in each world, because they've got to be spatio-temporally disconnected, so there can't be any shared individuals but they can duplicate each other. Um, and they can be recombined in every which way, every mathematically possible recombination, subject to the limitations, perhaps, of space and time being big enough. Um, so that's, that's the theory. Many philosophers have rejected Lewis's theory because of its ontological extravagance. They just simply couldn't believe that there are all these worlds, all these different discrete, disjoint space-times. Um, one is bad enough, as it were. Um, well, Lewis says, yes, it does go flat against common sense, but it's a terrific theory. It explains lots of stuff we want explained. It explains necessity and possibility. It explains propositions. It can explain uh, 
conditionals that we want to use, strong counterfactual conditionals uh, that have defied philosophers hitherto, uh, and so on. We, it gives you a theory of properties and all sorts of things. Uh, so we should accept the theory because of the advantages it brings, the philosophical advantages. It's a kind of inference to the best explanation. Um, the main difficulties for Lewis's theory, well, there, you know, there's a whole lot of difficulties that people have raised. I think that the main difficulties on the face of it are epistemological and perhaps also the ontological theory. One might wonder whether the balance is quite as favourable as Lewis thinks it is. Um, the epistemological problem on the face of it is the problem of how we know about all these other worlds that we have, by hypothesis, no, no access to. Um, uh, now, actually, I used to think that the epistemological difficulty was pretty well fatal to Lewis's theory, uh, that, you know, you had these remote, inaccessible space-times. How on earth could we know anything about what goes on in them? And how, therefore, could we know anything about what's necessary or what's possible, though not actual? Uh, that would involve knowledge of other possible worlds, but it seems to be that that's knowledge that we couldn't have because of our spatial disconnection from them. Actually, I'm not so sure about that objection now, in fairness to Lewis. It seems to me that he probably does have a way of answering the objection via the theory of recombination. Use the, his principle of recombination to... I mean, the crucial point is that he doesn't need to uh, really make out that we have knowledge of what goes on in, say, world 17. What we need to know is that there is a possible world of such and such a general kind. And that's maybe something that can be got at via the principle of recombination. But it seems to me that that brings attention or brings into focus where the real problem with Lewis's theory lies. The the recombination principle is a very strong principle that has very serious modal consequences. Anything can be recombined with anything, any which way. Uh, and Lewis is quite open about the fact that it rests on a kind of Humean atomism. Uh, that, I mean, in effect, it endorses Hume's principle. Um, that there are no necessary connections between distinct existences. Um, a similar view is taken by David Armstrong, who advocates another form of this combinatorial account of possibility. Um, well, well and good, but the modal consequences of this supposed analysis of possibility are extremely controversial, and it seems to me that it's open to anybody who thinks that there are necessary connections between distinct existences, as Hume would put it, to simply reject the theory precisely because it begs the question against them right at the outset. So anybody who takes seriously the old Aristotelian idea, for example, that amongst a thing's properties, some of them are essential to it and others are merely accidental, is going to reject Lewis's analysis straight out because Lewis's analysis says there are no necessary connections of that kind. There are no essential properties, no really essential properties. So I would put it very briefly by saying that what Lewis's theory does is to conflate two quite separate questions, one about the analysis of possibility and the other a theory about what possibilities there are. It writes in a very substantial theory about what possibilities there are into the analysis. And that makes it objectionable to anybody who doesn't share Lewis's views about what possibilities there are. And I don't, so I reject it. OK, so finally I can come to my own view, or at least the, the kind of view I think is right. And the, the kind of view I think is right is emphatically not a reductive view. Uh, that is, I think we have to reconcile ourselves to accepting some motial, modal notion or other uh, as, um, uh, 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 as uh, irreducible. Um, something we understand and perhaps can explain informally, 
but not something we can define or define in other terms. So let me give you, uh, first of all, a very simple example. Um, let's consider conjunction, what we express in English by the word and. Um, though the point doesn't concern just the English word and. If a conjunction is true, then each of its conjuncts is true. That is, if A and B is any conjunction, then if A and B is true, A is true separately and B is true separately. And that's something that must be the case. That is, it's necessary that if a conjunction is true, each of its conjuncts is true. Why is that? Well, there's a very simple answer. That's just part of what it is to be conjunction. It's part of the nature of conjunction. Why is that? Well, conjunction is a certain function from propositions to propositions. It's that function that takes a pair of propositions to a true proposition, just in case each of the pair is a true proposition. And otherwise, it takes them to a false proposition. Conjunction just is that function. So, it's necessary that if A and B, then B, for example, because it's true in virtue of the very nature or essence of conjunction. Not the meaning of the word and, but the function that the word and stands for, which is also uh, the function for which words in other languages like und in German and e in French, stand for. Um, OK, so if we generalise this um, idea, there's a sort of general pattern of what I shall call essentialist explanations of necessities, uh, which uh, is near the beginning of section four on page two of the handout. So we get explanations of the form necessarily so-and-so because it's true in virtue of the nature of such-and-such such, that something or other. Right? Uh, it may be that the proposition that follows necessarily and the proposition that comes right at the end are the same proposition or they might be different in certain cases. I give a few examples just as samples on the handout so I'll go through them just to give you sort of a bit of the idea. So we might say that necessarily Aristotle is a man because it's true by Aristotle's nature that he's a man. It's part of what it is to be Aristotle. Necessarily whales are mammals because it's true by the nature of whales that they're mammals. It's part of what it is to be a whale to be a mammal. <laughs> Necessarily gold is an element because it's true by the nature of gold that it's an element and not a compound. And so on. Uh, well, we can take more abstract examples like necessarily A plus B is B plus A for whole numbers A and B because it's true in virtue of the nature of addition that it's commutative. That is, it doesn't matter which order you add up a pair of numbers. Uh, at least as long as they're ordinary whole numbers, not ordinal numbers. Um, OK, so one can multiply examples in this way. I mean, you might want to dispute the particular ones I've given. All I'm suggesting is that we can give this kind of explanation. It's an in intelligible form of explanation of necessity. Um, now, uh, in terms of this sort of basic idea, we might formulate a kind of essentialist theory of necessity and possibility in this sort of way. Um, the theory will say that something, some proposition P is necessary if and only if, that's what the IFF means, um, and because there is something in virtue of whose nature it's true that P, or perhaps more accurately, because we may want to bring in the natures of several things, 
uh, rather than just one, it's necessary that P, if there are some things, X, Y, Z, and so on, uh, in virtue of whose natures, it's true that P. And then to say that it's possible that P is basically to say that there aren't any things whose natures rule out its being the case that P. That is, it's not the case that there are some things X, Y, and Z such that by virtue of the natures of X, Y, and Z, it's not the case that P. Yeah. So that's how the theory goes. Uh, in the remainder, what I want to do... How long have I got? <coughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes, yeah, OK. Um, well, I shall have to stop a bit short, but never mind. Um, uh, so let me say a bit first of all, to try and further explain the theory, and then, if I do have any time, to say a little bit about the sort of difficulties, or some of the sorts of difficulties, that the theory certainly encounters and needs to deal with. Well, the most obvious question is about the content of the theory, and in particular, about the notion of essence, or a thing's nature, or what it is to be a thing. Um, and... Uh, what I want to emphasise here is that, um, first of all, I don't think one can give a definition of essence in other terms, uh, a, a non-circular explanation. I think uh, what one has to do is simply appeal to one's ability to understand a distinction between what it is to be something and what, what it is for propositions to be true of something uh, that could have been otherwise, for example. So that it's part of what it is to be Aristotle, to be a man, but it's not part of what it is to be Aristotle, to be a philosopher, even though he was one. Aristotle might have not gone in for philosophy, or teaching, for example, but he couldn't not have gone in for being a man and been a frog instead, or a piece of paper, or something. Uh, this seems, uh, and is, absurd. Um, whales are mammals, and they could not have failed to be mammals. Things that aren't, whale, aren't mammals wouldn't have been whales. Um, and similarly for other examples. There's a very close connection between essence or nature of things and definition, where by definition, I mean definition in the old sense of definition of things rather than definition of words for things. Um, so uh, a definition in this sense tells you what it is to be something. Water is H2O is pretty close to being a reasonably good definition of water. It tells you what water is. It tells you that it's a certain combination, molecular combination, um, involving molecules of, composed of two hydrogen atoms and a single oxygen atom. Um, right, it's not, you know. Um, it's worth noting that in some cases there's a very close connection between definition of words and definition of things. For example, I might tell you uh, that a square is a four-sided closed figure composed of four straight lines of equal length meeting at right angles. What have I done? Have I told you what a square is or have I told you what the word square means? Well, it seems to me I've done both at the same go. Uh, that is, there are many, and there are many other examples where one can do this, where a perfectly good definition of a thing could equally well serve as a definition of the corresponding word or a word for the thing. Uh, but this is obviously not always the case. There are cases like the water case where it seems to me that the definition of the stuff, water, as H2O, is not 
plausibly construed as a definition of the word water. I mean, it, it's difficult to be very sure about examples like this because so many people now know that water is H2O that it may well be that you know, words change their meaning and water has come to mean something about H2O. Uh, but it certainly didn't mean that in the 17th century, um, uh, for example, um, when people didn't uh, know about the atomic constitution of things, although they might have had their suspicions. Um, okay, so uh, sometimes, but not always, there are these links between verbal definition and real definition, as it's sometimes called. Um, one point of some importance that I ought to emphasise is that when a, I mean a, a definition in the real sense that I'm interested in um, uh, tells you what the essential properties of something are. And if that's true, if it gives you a true account of what the essential properties are, that itself will be necessarily true. The nature of a thing couldn't have been otherwise. It couldn't have had a different essence or nature. So uh, the um, effect of that is that you have this principle at the bottom of page two that if it's, I'm writing it's true in virtue of the nature of x by writing box subscript x, it's true in virtue of the nature of x that x is phi, then it'll be necessarily the case that it's true in virtue of the nature of x that x is phi. Um, well, that might seem to put this theory smack bang in line for being skewered on the necessity horn of Blackburn's dilemma that I mentioned earlier. Remember that you're just explaining one necessity in terms of another, um, so no explanation at all. Um, I think it would be if Blackburn's dilemma were any good, um, but I think the dilemma is actually no good. Um, Blackburn misses a crucial distinction between, uh, I mean, he's of course dead right that uh, what you appeal to to explain why necessarily P, some proposition Q, will itself be necessary or not, as may be. And uh, what he misses is that you could appeal to Q to explain why necessarily P without explaining it in terms of the necessity of Q, even though Q is necessary. That is, what's crucial is whether when you appeal to Q, you're uh, appealing to the plain truth of Q or to the necessity of Q. And there's no reason why you need to be explaining the necessity of P in terms of the necessity of Q as opposed to the truth of Q. Of course, many explanations of necessity do do that. They're what one might call transmissive explanations. That is, one says, well, necessarily Q because necessarily P and P Q follows from P. That's a transmissive explanation. It transmits the necessity of P to Q and thereby explains why Q is necessary. But they don't have to go that way. You could just be explaining why necessarily P in terms of the plain truth of Q. Uh, so I don't think the dilemma works um, on the necessity horn. I don't think it works on the other horn either, but that's another issue. Um, OK. Uh, this raises the question, however, what kind of explanation the essentialist theory can provide. Uh, the worry that Blackburn's dilemma raises would indeed be troublesome if one were trying to give a reductive explanation of necessity. But as I've emphasised, I'm not trying to do that. I don't think one can do that. If one can't give a reductive explanation, if one can't explain necessity in other wholly non-modal terms, what can one do? Well, this is a kind of situation that philosophers have come up against in other cases. 
um, when you're dealing with fundamental notions, uh, there's no digging deeper. So what do you do? Well, you dig sideways. Uh, that is, you try to make interesting conceptual connections between the concept you're trying to illuminate and other coordinate concepts, as it were. You're not getting deeper, you're simply drawing connections. Uh, and that's the best we can do. And that's, I think, what we can do in the case of necessity. The notion of essence, or the thing's nature, is itself a modal notion. You can't really explain what it is for a property to be essential to something, except by using some sort of modal notion. An essential property of something is a property without which the thing just wouldn't be. That is, wouldn't exist. Aristotle couldn't exist without being a man. That's what part of what it is for the property to be essential to him. Perhaps it's not the whole of what it is, because he couldn't exist without its being the case that 2 plus 2 is 4. But it isn't part of what it is to be Aristotle that 2 plus 2 is 4. So one needs to do a bit of explaining to, as it were, narrow down the essential properties. You can't just say they are the necessary properties. My point is that uh, we're, we're using a modal notion, the notion of essence or nature, to explain necessity. So we're moving sideways rather than downwards to something non-modal. In fact, we're doing slightly better than that because what the effect of the essentialist theory is, is to locate a sort of base class, a core of fundamental necessities, in terms of which all other necessities can be explained, if the theory works. Right. <coughs> okay. Well, I've got... Have I got any time? Yes. yes it's Five it's minutes? Time. Maybe. Yes. Let, me, let me just gesture a fairly sort of serious area of... I mean, there are all sorts of problems about this theory, and I'm sure you will find problems of your own that I haven't thought of. But one very serious area of difficulty arises from the fact that the, the principles, the principles that I've, the basic principles of theory, the principles I've called necessity and possibility on page two, I think, of the handout, yes, in section 4.2, um, you'll notice if you look at these principles that they in both involve unmodalized quantifications on the right-hand side, right? So it says, necessity tells, tells you, for example, that it's necessary that P, if and only if there exists X1 through to Xn such that it's true in virtue of the nature of X1 through to Xn, that P. Now, there's no modal operator on the right-hand side, no necessity. The, the there exists here, the X1, the variables X1 through to Xn, vary over things of any kind you like. They may be individuals like Aristotle, they may be kinds of things like whales, or stuff like water, or numbers, or whatever. Um, it's, it's really important to the theory that these variables range over all sorts of different things. Some of the things over which they range, some of the possible values of these variables, are plausibly taken to be things which perhaps do exist, but might not have existed contingently existing things. Now that, that raises a worry, doesn't it? <coughs> because what if it's necessary that P, as things are, because there are, as it happens, some things, in virtue of whose natures it is the case that P, where those things might not have existed? Right? Well, maybe if they hadn't existed and there hadn't been other things, in virtue of whose natures it would have been the case that P, then it wouldn't have been necessary that P, even though it is actually necessary that P, there is a possible situation in which it wouldn't have been the case that P. So you get a failure of the S4 principle. Something is necessary, but not necessarily necessary, and hence a failure of the S5 principle. Right. So you've got to worry. And there's a similar worry also about the existence of things other than the ones that actually exist. Perhaps there might have been things, perhaps something is possible as things stand, 
because there aren't any things whose natures rule it out. But maybe there could have been some things whose natures would have ruled it out. So that the possibility is only a relative form of possibility after all. So there's a sort of serious looking worry here. Um, well, the, the worry can take different forms, in fact. Um, in one worry is the worry about what I call uh, iterated necessities. Um, this is on page three of my handout. Um, suppose you take something like, um, I mean, I'm just going to sketch this worry and uh, not give my answer to it um, now, um, uh, but just, just to make you aware of the problem because I'm running out of time. Suppose you take some, suppose you think, for example, that it's uh, necessary that Aristotle is a man, where you think that Aristotle is somebody who did exist but might not have existed. That's the sort of common sense view. I mean, it's not the only possible view. Um, uh, there's been a defence in recent years of a very interesting opposed view known as necessitism, according to which everything that there is exists of necessity. Even Aristotle and me and you. Um, now, I don't think this view is obviously wrong, and if I were to hold it, this problem would go away. Um, I'm interested in whether you can solve the problem without adopting it, um, because I'm not sure that I think it's correct. Um, but, okay, so take the proposition that Aristotle is essentially a man, and so necessarily a man. Allowing for Aristotle's possible non-existence, you might formulate this as it's necessarily the case that if Aristotle exists, then he's a man, or if anything is Aristotle, then it's a man. Well, by the theory, by the principle, my principle of necessity, that will be true if and only if there is something in virtue of whose nature it's true that if something is Aristotle, it's a man or if anything is Aristotle, it's a man. Um, and by the principle of iteration, uh, that, uh, the original proposition, necessarily anything that is Aristotle is a man, is itself going to be necessary. That is, it'll be necessarily necessarily, necessarily necessary <coughs> that if anything is Aristotle, it's a man. And so applying the theory again, using the equivalence that I drew attention to, it seems to follow that it's necessarily the case that there exists something in virtue of the nature of which anything that is Aristotle is a man. But suppose Aristotle hadn't existed, what else could it be? You might think, well, nothing, you know. <laughs> so it looks like we end up with an unacceptable conclusion. One reaction to that problem would be to deny that necessity is absolute after all, that metaphysical necessity is absolute. Another would be to deny that the right logic of metaphysical necessity is S5, as I've claimed it is. Naturally, I don't want to give up on either of those propositions, so I need a different solution. Um, uh, and um, Well, I think one can solve the problem by restricting the principle of substitution that I've in effect used in getting to the unacceptable conclusion um, and disallowing substitution of sentences involving the true in virtue of operator that's used in formulating the essentialist theory and that that's something that one can do not in an ad hoc way but on principle um, because claims about essence have more content than just ordinary necessities. Um, but that's just a very quick uh, argument. Um, the more serious difficulty, and here I'll have to end with just this, just outlining the difficulty, I think the more serious difficulty arises over the idea that um, uh, some actually existing things might not have existed and so their natures or essences wouldn't have existed, with the result that 
some things which are as things stand necessary wouldn't have been necessary. Their opposites would have been possible because there would have been no natures to constrain them. And the opposite difficulty that uh, had there been some, as it were, new things, distinct individuals from all the individuals there actually are, their natures might have imposed constraints on possibilities that don't actually obtain with the result that some things that are as things stand possible would have failed to be possible, would have been ruled out. Um, that looks like a hard problem. And indeed it is quite a hard problem. I think that problem can be solved, um, uh, but I'm not going to try and solve it right now, although if somebody provokes me, I, I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> because I think I've already gone past my allotted time. Well, yeah. well thank, thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, we could easily have heard you for a lot longer, but we should... Thank you. Yeah.